The, the question is whether uh, the, the BDS movement, which utilizes the concept or the tool of boycott as a um, social justice uh, expression and form of protest, whether that's protected under the United States Constitution and Supreme Court precedent. Absolutely. Uh, there is no question that boycott, not only from the civil rights movement, continues even today when you have boycotts relating to people who discriminate against the gay and lesbian community, people who discriminate against or, or support uh, uh, anti-environment or anti-climate uh, businesses. So people boycott Exxon, people boycott all these corporations and organizations around the country. So it is protected and there's a, a huge amount of case law that supports it. And just for, you know, uh, academic issues, the word boycott, you think about how the word boycott came into the English language. Boycott came into the English language, it was the name of a British slumlord in Ireland. His name was Sir Boycott. <laughs> and what happened is that he, uh, this landlord, uh, was wrongfully evicting all these poor Irish people from their apartments. He was a bigot and he was a slumlord. So what happened is that all of the people around that community, the Irish uh, workers who worked with this uh, Sir Boycott, they all got together and said, we're no longer going to work for boycott. And that was the birth of the word boycott. So it started as a social justice tool to stand up to oppression, discrimination, and economic injustice. And that was in the 1800s. And it came into the English language. So for us as activists who want to stop and end the one who wants to end the occupation, want to stop the apartheid system, we're entitled to use our right to boycott uh, working or buying Israeli uh, goods or ask people to boycott the cultural and, uh, and academic work with the Israelis as a form of protest. That is quintessential American. Yeah, I just, just to mention, um, the boycott against uh, South African apartheid, boycott, divestment, and sanctions was used very, very widely. We boycotted grapes and lettuce for years to help the farm workers yep. organize in California. I mean, it's really, it's, it's very, and it comes even out of the uh, abolition movement in Absolutely. England. They had a massive boycott of sugar because sugar was being grown by enslaved people in the Caribbean. So boycott, it's historically part of, I think, British and American, and American uh, tradition as a, as a, you know, a legitimate, nonviolent tool and uh, still, still exists. So it's, uh, yeah, I, you know, I agree. Just wanted to add those examples. For One more example, the Coalition of Emokali Workers that just participated right. in their demonstration who are calling for a boycott of Wendy's and nobody yeah. is right. attempting to make it that illegal right. in any way. So sure. there are many boycotts going on. Yeah. Um, in terms of the family being scattered and family reuni reunification, uh, there were small incidences of family reunification from 1948 even through 1967 um, in order to enable uh, families that were part in the West Bank, part in inside Israel to be able to get their residency rights and to be able to move uh, back to their homes in Palestine and in, in historic Palestine, present day Israel. But those were very, very limited. And the, the truth of the matter is, is that the issue of the refugees is much larger than even the Red Cross. So, you know, you have UN Resolution 194. It upholds the right of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and their homeland um, or get reparations for it. And up until now, the UN, which is a stronger body than conceivably than the Red Cross, has not been able to enforce Israel to do this. And that's why I talk about the complicity of the international community. Because there are enough resolutions that were, were they to be enacted, and there is the Fourth Geneva Convention that upholds the rights of Palestinians or, 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 or provides the laws under which um, Israel must act. If the, U, if, if the UN were only to, Im, to implement these laws, you would not have the situation that you have now, but Israel's kind of been given a green light by the international community, even though these resolutions are passed, 
the strength of the U.S., the strength of Europe, and their support for Israel entails that most Palestinian refugees, 50%, have not been able to return to their homes. Um, or 50% of the Palestinian population still live as refugees. And in actuality, while I was in Palestine, the Red Cross was uh, facilitated a lot of the family visits to prisoners, but they were only able to do what, a, what Israel allowed them to do. So if they would deny a, a family member a permit because they were in prison, previously in prison, so they wouldn't allow them a permit inside Israel to go visit another family member that was in prison. When um, families tried to go to the Red Cross to request their support in, in, in fighting this, the Red Cross kind of put their hands up and said, there's nothing we can do. And that's what we see from UN agencies, from UNDP, that operates United Nations Development Program, that operates in Palestine and Israel, the UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Works Agency, they are all answerable to Israel. They, none of them, these international bodies, these international aid agencies, have any power to impact any kind of change in legislation or, or, or policy by Israel. John, I, I'm John Moscow, I'm a member of JDP of Northern New Jersey. Um, I also have two questions. The first is, um, in terms of New Jersey's uh, BDS law, um, which we were also involved in trying to stop, um, is there any way that you understand that um, that, that can be challenged? terms of um, what would be required for, say, a group like JVP to have standing to challenge this law. Um, you know, so that's the first question. And the second question is, in terms of repression in the occupied territories, is if you could talk a little bit about how do you see the role of the Palestinian Authority, either in any role whatsoever? Well, on, on finding plaintiffs, it's, it's not so simple because you would need someone to apply, because uh, again, I, I read the, the, the BDS legislation around the country vary. Some are divesting from pension funds, some are saying that we would not do business with any company that accepts divesting. So we would need to have a New Jersey-based company that uh, gets a contract from New Jersey, from the government, and then that company publicly says, I support divestment, um, and then you would have yourself a plaintiff, and the likelihood is that that plaintiff is likely to succeed and, and find that the law is unconstitutional, because there is established Supreme Court uh, precedent that says that the government cannot earmark uh, or defund uh, certain organizations or um, vendors based on opinion or, or freedom of expression. Uh, and that applies a lot to issues relating to, for example, termination of pregnancies and abortion. So there's a lot of these um, government rules that will defund you on abortion, and there's some precedent that would allow uh, us to challenge the constitutionality of the defunding based on, on freedom of expression. So that, that's still something that many organizations like Palestine Legal, Center for Constitutional Rights, are looking for plaintiffs the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, I'm a member of the National Board of the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, we're also searching to identify plaintiffs. Because the law on its face is clearly uh, unconstitutional, but finding a plaintiff is, has, has been very difficult. Uh, there is the case of the ACLU um, who r raised uh, federal legislation or, or, or challenging federal legislation in the case of Kansas with a teacher, I don't know the details. Yes, that is pending, that is true. That, that's a teacher who was uh, teaching something relating to, to Palestine um, and, and she was prohibited from, uh, either she was fired or her rights were restricted and I think the ACLU has uh, picked up that case, that's true. And the other part of your question the other was, question the was the role of the Palestinian Authority. How do you analyze the oh. role of the Palestinian Authority? The role of the Palestinian Authority, I mean, I think that the Palestinian Authority was put in place to do the job that it's doing quite well, which is being a proxy to the Israeli occupation. There is nothing that indicates in the past, what has it been, 20 years? Where, where, 20, 25 years? years. Um, since Oslo, since the beginning of the peace accords, that the Palestinian Authority has been able to do anything 
to in any way challenge the ongoing occupation. If we look at the last 20, 25 years, we see increase in settlement building. We see uh, an increase in the devastation um, and the intensity of Israel's attacks uh, against Palestinians. Uh, the, the one thing is individuals like me who benefited because I was able to get a Palestinian ID and now I can go back and live in, inside Ramallah. Um, and there are a number of Palestinians that were able to go back and because they had relatives in the Palestinian Authority, my father worked with the PLO, he worked in the PA. So I was able to get, but beyond that individual ability, which is important for, for Palestinians to be able to go back home, um, it, 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 there really is not any impact. And, uh, and unfortunately, what's actually going on is like I said, it, they're, they're carrying out um, you know, uh, uh, attacks against Palestinian activists and trying to almost protect Israel um, uh, in a certain way. And, and it's, it's obvious that they are totally dependent on US funding. Um, there is no sustainability. I mean, as, as a people, Palestinians were more sustainable in terms of being able to take care of ourselves, more self-sufficient, in terms of farming, in terms of produce, in terms of, in the West Bank and Gaza at least, during the first intifada than we are now. So we are totally dependent on international aid at this point. Um, Palestinians are in debt for everything. Every, you know, uh, capitalism came into play and now everybody owns a new car and a new house and a new, and we're totally individually in debt and as a nation in debt, or as a, as a people in debt. Um, and there's been no movement economically, politically forward for Palestinians. So unfortunately, I think the, the, the role of the PA is, is a very negative one. And actually, we need to move beyond that. But until there is an alternative, alternative Palestinian vision for what we want for the future, uh, the PA is going to continue to play the role that it's and especially Jews um, and Palestinians in America. I haven't been here long. Um, my experience is that people usually draw a target and kind of like have a target and then draw a path to it. Um, um, back home, the Palestinian Jewish debate is not a constructive one. Uh, despite the fact that all the information is out there to be learned. Um, so I'm, if, if you feel that knowledge is what's going to change people's lives, like, you know, uh, being on the issue here, um, then sure, go for it. But I'm, I'm, my experience with these types of issues is that really knowledge is twisted and manipulated, and then the word, the word terrorist kind of trumps everything. But, um, but you could negate that so effectively, Ra rather than, as my friend said earlier, we need to stop preaching to the choir. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm of the opinion that we need to engage and we need to debate. Yeah. Because
because the, the issue is you, you have to think about um, where did the pro-Zionist position take root in the US? It got mainstreamed. So if, if you look at po political, ethnic political participation in our country, I mean, prior to the 1940s, 1950s, if you look at the, let's just use four ethnic groups, Jews, American Jews, Italian, Irish, and African American. I mean, these people were totally irrelevant to American political decision making. Institutional discrimination, I mean, Jews changed their names so they couldn't even get into universities. They were going to CUNY and going to all the state schools because they didn't go anywhere. Um, law firms that were born relating to corporate law were certain types of firms that the white shoe firms would not touch. So you had these Harvard-trained American Jewish lawyers taking those types of cases and, and developed firms. It, the discrimination was so extreme. Uh, same with the Irish. I mean, the Irish weren't even considered white. Um, African Americans, I mean, we have a history of 100 years, 200 years, 100 years of slavery, 100 years of segregation. Italians, I've read stuff about describing Italians as, you know, biologically inferior to white people. Look at those experiences, and the only time it changed is when they mainstreamed. So basically, once they mainstreamed in the 60s, these groups started to have political clout. And uh, the Zionist group started post-67, mainstreaming this one position, unconditional support, Israel can do no wrong, occupation is legitimate, it's all terrorism, everybody who's against Israel is an anti-Semite, everybody against Israel is uh, you know, looking to kill all the Jews in the world, and another Holocaust. So they mainstreamed it. So if we're not able to debate and bring mainstream Americans into this audience, especially younger people, which now they're picking up steam at campuses. So we need to get more young people in here, young professionals. If we mainstream it, that's where the change is gonna happen. So you have, you have to engage, you have to fight. A third opinion. <laughs> um, forget about trying to respond. Do, Take, you know, adopt a campaign, uh, preferably a BDS campaign. I personally think it's the most effective way but it could be something, um, you know, JVP's Deadly Exchange campaign is a perfect um, example. Um, there's a lot of consumer boycott, uh, dis, you know, divestment campaigns. Once you do that, what you do is you're pushing the discourse. And people will come to talk to you as opposed to you trying to get them into a room to discuss with them and ask you, why are you calling for the boycott? I know Israel is doing some bad things, but Really, boycott is not, is not the right way. So they will begin to engage with you, and that's when they at least, you know, they have a mind that's open enough to begin to listen to the arguments that you have to make. And I think that that's the way that you expand. In 2005, when I came back from living in Palestine, and I, we had just started the BDS movement, um, we had just put out the July 9th Palestinian Civil Society call, I came to New York charged and ready to go. There was a big anti-war movement going on and I figured that this would be you know, the perfect entry point and I started to go to these demonstrations with other you know, individuals that supported Palestine and supported BDS and I remember groups like Code Pink refusing to even take the flyer about Palestine from my hands because it was a divisive issue, okay? Fast forward five years later, 2010, Code Pink has the Ahava campaign, which is one of the most successful BDS campaigns in the US. JVP has adopted the BDS call in its entirety. Okay? There, are, um, there are things that, that, that happen on the ground that push people beyond their comfort zone, and there are things that you can develop here that can push people beyond their comfort zone, and that's what you need to do. So it's not a discussion about who's right or who's wrong, it's about we know what Israel is doing. How is it best to confront it? Yeah, but the mainstream America doesn't know what they're doing is wrong. So you have to educate them. And we're not living in these little silos of a couple of people who already know. You know, if you're not going to be able to have a more diverse group that you're mainstreaming these issues, and we also need solutions. So we're very lucky. Uh, Professor Fadi is working on a theoretical solution. So we're advocating for boycott. Then what? Is it the two-state solution? Is it the one-state solution? What's the constitutional design? 
theoretically for a one state to the binational solution. All right, we have some scholars here who are working on that. So when you're gonna come to American Jewry and you're gonna try to build momentum and engage them to be intellect, to have integrity about these issues, they're gonna ask you, then what? Okay, we'll boycott, but where, where's that gonna lead? So if we don't have answers, and if we're just gonna be you know, bombarding uh, and preaching to the choir, we're not gonna make a difference. I wanna engage, and I think debating, especially politicians, if, if JPP can convince you know, a pro-Zionist politician in New Jersey to come up and debate me on these issues, I'm open. I debate all the time. I just want to say, I mean, I think we, we can't assume too much rationality among people that we're, you know, trying to engage. And so we, ha we have, uh, and I think, you know, as Reham is talking about, we have to really build our strength, build our organization. I think it's fine as we're, we're building this movement to speak to people who basically agree or maybe are questioning. And then with that more strength, we can then be more forceful in whatever we're doing. And, and more effective, you know, we get to a point where people are then, oh, like, what's this all about? But I think at, at this point, I think building our strength, I mean, that's, here I go, I'll just do a little commercial for our committee list, because if more people are working with us and are signing up for committees, we can spread our influence, we can spread our effect, and we can begin to reach more people. I think the things that we've heard today, I mean, constantly what we hear today is, Israel is the only democratic society in that region. What kind of democratic society is that? I mean, uh, we have information. Information is ammunition. But we need to know how to use it. And I think we can, we've can. we learned a lot today that we can use. We have a lot of concrete examples about the, you know, the things that maybe some of us have known about, but a lot of other people don't know about. That there's two systems of laws. I mean, I remember years ago, I met a Palestinian student in, um, uh, not around here, somewhere else, and he was telling me about the two licenses, the driver, the car licenses. Yep. Now, Yellow. I had never heard of that. I mean, I had no idea, and I was a fairly progressive person. I was, you know, involved and concerned about the issues that, you know, Palestinians get one color of license plate and the Jews get another color of license plate so that the police and the military forces instantly, as soon as they see your car, they know who you are and whether you belong there or not. And then are you okay on that road? Because that's a Jewish road. You're not supposed to be over there. So this kind of stuff, you know, begins to awaken people. And I think the difference in the two systems of laws, the way children are being treated, I think hopefully is very shocking, I would hope, to many, many people in this country. But I think that's, that's something we have to use to build our strength, build our forces, and the more people that are involved, you know, the more we can do. A any other questions? So I don't if I could just add to that, there's a really good video that just came out from the U uh, U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights called Palestine 101, It's Not That Complicated. It's a four minute video that whoever, however, you can get people to see just puts everything that we just talked about in kind of a nutshell. And it's a good primer for anybody that really doesn't know, but again, is at least has the beginnings of being interested in knowing. Um, it, it, it's a very good resource. Did you call that again? Palestine 101, it's not that complicated. And the organization again? U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. It used to be the U.S. Yeah. Campaign to End the Occupation, it's now the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. Just building on that as well, um, when we talk Palestinians and Jewish in Israel, usually the conversation in the U.S. tends to be, you know, the proper Israel and then the Palestinian um, occupied territories and often 20% of the population in Israel which are Palestinian are neglected altogether. That happened in the Oslo Agreement and it happens also, like often again and again um, in conversations about how <coughs> Palestinians in Israel are Palestinians. Their political activism and political rights uh, are being subjected to a different different set of uh, um, limitations, but they still are be facing um, this uh, uh, kind of oppression as well, and they should not be forgotten altogether from the conversation. And Stefan, uh, I have two questions. Uh, 
if the if the Palestine Authority is working, as as you pointed out, in cooperation or carrying out Israel's bidding, who speaks the Palestinians? What authority? What government entity? And I may have missed it. You spoke about the about the problems and, and, and the Palestine being oppressed on every level, on every venue. I didn't hear any suggestion of a solution. So, so if, if you, I don't expect you to present a full-blooded solution in answer to a question, you know, in the last five minutes. But those, it seems to me those two points come together in terms of, of Palestine having the withdrawal and the the substance to to speak collectively in in getting a state and 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 getting a basis for a state. You're absolutely right. There is a vacuum, for lack of a better word, within Palestinian leadership for anybody that does not believe in the structure that the PA has established. For many, many years, we used to look to the Palestine Liberation Organization as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. With the establishment of the PA, the roles of these, and the fact that Abu Ammar Yasser Arafat was the chairman and the, of one and the president of the other, the, the role of these two organizations became convoluted. The lack of a Palestinian vision, which, uh, you know, um, Abed spoke about um, is a problem, but that does not negate the need for the end of the Israeli occupation and colonization, the equality of Palestinians living inside Israel, and the right of refugees to return. So even though there is not a set, you know, everybody keeps asking where is, you know, Palestine's ANC or Palestine's Nelson Mandela, as an organization that's working in the U.S. that believes in social justice, equality, and rights, you can still work within that platform, even though there is not one particular Palestinian leadership that you can say, this is a representative of all the Palestinian people. If anybody tells you that it exists, they're lying to you. It does but, not. But, you, pardon, but it seems to me you're not mentioning the elephant in the room. Hamas won the popular vote, I don't know how many years ago. Um, 2007. Uh, 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 yeah, are they ten viewed, years ago. Yeah, are they viewed? It's been ten years. Yeah. Uh, there hasn't uh, been a re-election. Uh, 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 are they viewed as a, as a viable uh, government body? Uh, I mean, going uh, moving away from the characterizations of their of every Hamas member having a bomb in their back pocket, moving away from that, <laughs> are they a viable uh, uh, alternative? as a government, because if you don't, if Palestine doesn't have anyone to represent them, they are a tremendous disadvantage because Israel has spent a lot of time. Yeah, but they do have somebody that represents them. For all intents and purposes, the Palestinian Authority does represent the Palestinian position. Hamas also is part and parcel of the fabric of the political movements in Palestine. Uh, recently, they amended their charter they are asking for two, they have supported two state solution. They are talking about 67 borders. They're in the middle of a reconciliation. So of course, Palestinians now are moving and trying to mend fences to formulate a more mainstream support for a position. In other words, the PA does have certain support. Doesn't mean that they have overwhelming support. Uh, Hamas has support, but they're trying to mend. So there is, you can't say there's nobody talking on behalf of the Palestinians because they are. They, they are in discussions, I mean, from an international law perspective, uh, the Oslo Accords and so forth. The PA does represent them. It doesn't mean that I agree with them. It doesn't mean that uh, I'm happy with what they're doing. Uh, but I see that the Palestinians are moving towards trying to find a unified government that incorporates Hamas uh, under the rubric of the PLO. But that actually kind of negates 50% of the Palestinian population that's living outside of Palestine. Because the only persons, the people that participated in the elections were Palestinians that were in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And I respect Abed. I, you know, I have my political views, he has his political views. Yeah. 
and Fadi has their his political views where three Palestinians I don't think we're going to agree. You know, so the, the, there is a, there is a problem. Again, that problem does not negate fighting for the rights of people, and that's and this has to be the component for now. That's not to say that tomorrow another leadership is not going to come up, or there isn't going to be this you know uh, unification with the PA, and then all of a sudden the PA is going to go back to its liberatory roots of the PLO and and start to represent its people in an appropriate way, where more people feel that they are connected. Most people still believe in the Palestine Liberation Organization and believe in its need to be. So it's not to say that this is never going to happen. It just, to a certain extent, is not where we need it to be right now. And you, you, can't, you can't negate the role of the repression against the leadership, assassination, jailing. I remember reading years ago, I don't remember if Arafat had already died or just was ill and getting older, and I remember reading an article that said that, oh, who's going to be the future, the future leader that could take his place? And they said, well, Marwan Baghouti. He's a, you know, that has a lot of uh, leadership experience and qualities, a lot of respect and everything, and, and he could be a, a future leader, you know. Next thing you see, he's in jail under, I, I don't know how many decades it is already. Multiple life sentences. Yeah, for, for what? I mean, you know, these cooked up, framed up kind of uh, charges to keep him out of the picture so that whatever he does, he has to do from jail. And as you can see, that must be very difficult, you know. Um, the ANC, by the time Nelson Mandela and the leadership were put into prison, um, had an organizational nucleus and also they were able to get refuge outside in other countries and continue a lot of their work. This is a very different situation when people are living right there, you know, and uh, it's, you know, I think we, we can't ignore that, the, the role of, the, of repression and assassination There's in terms of that. Yeah. Uh, well, <coughs> you said that because I suspect that there's probably people that Israel identified as potential threats, charismatic leaders that they probably, that we may not even know, none of us, even the three of you may not know about, that they grabbed and threw them in jail or even murdered them. But there's going to be others. So I'm not worried at this point about leadership. I think the points that you're raising, you know, address it pretty well. I mean, the leaders will come once we have a groundswell support, you know, for Palestinian sovereignty. I just want to thank you very much for all your information and just to uh, support what Liam just said. You know, I think it's a very American thing and maybe a Western thing for us to say um, collectively, uh, we, we oppose Israeli occupation, but what, how are the Palestinians going to lead themselves? We oppose apartheid, but what is going to, how are the black <laughs> Africans going to govern themselves? We really think we should pull out of Iraq, but how are the Iraqis going to handle it's like a very, not, which isn't to say that we don't care about those issues and we shouldn't educate ourselves about, about those issues, but our job is to fight the occupation and fight the oppression. That's our job. And then to support what we believe is democratic reform when it happens after, after the, but that's our job as Americans. And actually and the only thing that Palestinians are asking you to do is just end your complicity. Because the fact of the matter is, is through our churches, through our schools, through our own tax dollars, we are supporting the maintenance of this system. You know, Congress passed, you know, $38 billion uh, support to Israel. Um, you know, there's, there's, th there's that reality. So it's not even to support us in our struggle for freedom. It's to stop, you know, oppressing us alongside our oppressors. Can be then challenged. If we know what the legal basis, and surely there are, 
And perhaps some member of the panel can address that. The, there is no legal basis for it. <laughs> Believe it or not. I'm asking you to play devil's advocate. Yeah. Because I know I don't, you don't. But there must be a legal rationale. Yeah, ba basically that the BDS is movement it? is a uh, racist, anti-Semitic movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically a hate group. That's, that's and so that's that's one thing, and that our foreign policy uh, is unconditional with Israel and should be uh, taken into account uh, in these types of uh, circumstances. And so those, those are challengeable. Those those are challengeable with no no question. And you are All we need is plaintiffs. Yep. You know, once we have some plaintiffs, because they're creating blacklists. Yep. So basically, they're saying the New Jersey. Uh, legislative Research Center or Institute is supposed to research all of the companies that we do business with and make sure that they're not on the list that supports BDS. So they are doing basically content, opinion-based blacklists. That violates the First Amendment, that violates every conceivable theory under American democracy and, and constitutional law. But we have to get those plaintiffs to be able to challenge it. I don't recall anyone saying you're punishing, and I've heard this argument, you're punishing the Israeli people by doing this. Yes. Uh, I didn't hear this argument, you're punishing the South African people. So no. no. So that, that could be sense. That I mean, sense. But the same people would be very supportive of like uh, UN sanctions on Iran. Yes. <laughs> and on other countries like Syria, yeah. Um, which is the same yeah. thing, but through a more institutionalized... But that's even, that's a government approach. So the government is entitled to take sanctions. We as American uh, citizens, we have the constitutional right to boycott. I don't want my university to invest in Israel. I'm entitled to say that. So, so from a constitutional scrutiny perspective, these laws would not withstand constitutional scrutiny. Mm -hmm. But we need yeah. to get plaintiffs. These are political, I, I lobby just like the Ju uh, Jewish uh, Voices for Peace against this bill. I even had friends who were in the legislature. So I say, yeah, you know, I agree with you, but you know, everybody's voting for it and I got a lot of pressure. So even people were, who voted in favor know it's unconstitutional, but because of political pressure, uh, because the pro-Israeli lobby has invested substantial amounts of money to lobby state legislators. This is new. Not only state legislators, but you're getting into BDS at county and at city levels. This is a orchestrated movement, again, to mainstream it. So all they're trying to do is to mainstream it, that automatically you associate BDS with something being very hate-driven, anti-Semitic, even though it's not the truth. I mean, if you keep repeating, I was reading a very good piece yesterday, Daniel Burke in CNN writes a lot of really interesting stuff on, uh, on religion. So he was talking, he did an interview with this guy who wrote a book about the origin of blood libel when it was scapegoating Jews that they were killing Christian children and using their bloods in rituals and churches. So this guy uh, did a, uh, a book trying to uh, identify when did this blood libel come around. And he, find, he identified it uh, uh, in, sometime in like in the 18th century, even though it was a lie and it's clearly a fiction, but they kept on repeating it. So what happened is that uh, there was another case that where this blood libel worked in England, where this crusade, uh, a knight from the Crusaders, comes back from the crusade, disaster, uh, in debt, he owed money to a Jewish banker. He didn't want to pay the Jewish banker. He killed the Jewish banker when he got back. So he was, at try he was being tried for the murder of the Jewish banker. He got acquitted because of this whole perception of blood libel, where he said, you would say, even though, you know what, it may not be true, but other stuff is true. Just like Trump tweeting the three videos about anti-Muslim, you know what, like what Sanders said yesterday, mm -hmm. oh, you know what, it may not be true, but the tr threat is real. So you could take lies and fiction, keep repeating it, becomes reality. So, and that's what's happening with the BDS, and we have to fight back and let them know. This is a organization, this is a movement that is the most diverse movement you can imagine. From every race, religion, 
The momentum at universities is for this boycott movement. This is not a Palestinian ethnic or a Jewish ethnic. This is everybody, because everybody doesn't want to stand for this systemic apartheid system. <coughs> Uh, Mia, I, I appreciated what you were saying about the Palestinian, Palestinian Authority because it was so clear. And I thought you mentioned in your talk that your father had been part of the PLO he was. and the Palestinian Authority. We had a lot of discussions in our house. <laughs> so I'm interested if you would share that. You talked about your mom and your sister. I was interested in you and him and the evolution of attitudes and when it began for you in particular to change? Right. Well, it didn't, it wasn't, it's not that clear. Prior to Oslo, regardless of what political party you were in, uh, Hamas, PFLP, um, the Fatah, uh, the DFLP, any political party that you were in, for the most part, even though Hamas was not part of the PLO, we all believed in one vision for Palestine which was a democratic, secular state in historic Palestine, meaning the occupied territories, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the 1948 territories. So even if my mother, who was more left-leaning and PFLP, and my father, who was Fatah, um, argued day and night about their political perspectives, the ultimate objective, just like a Democrat and a Republican, you're fighting about you know, which view you have in terms of taxes or in terms of health care, or to, but ultimately, you're both supporting what's best for the United States. So you can find some kind of, well, okay, not these days. <laughs> Let's say you're part of the Democratic Party and the Green Party. I don't know, find two parties, right? You're kind of agreeing, but it's both, both of you are coming from what is in the best interest of the US. You disagree on how to get there, but that is your ultimate perspective. So even though we were having these discussions in our house, um, and I always lean more towards my mother than my father. We, there was still very a lot of respect. And my mother was actually working at the Palestine Mission to the United Nations, so she technically also worked for the PA. And she was the ambassador to Holland for four years. That doesn't mean just saying the PA, I don't mean that there's no dissent within the PA. I don't mean that there are not different, differing opinions within the PA. Um, the PA now employs a majority of the Palestinians living inside the occupied territories, other, uh, w whether it's in the government or teachers, police officers. I mean, they have salaries for most Palestinians. But there is still that discussion about politically, in terms of the political decision that it took for them to sign on to Oslo and then come back to the Palestinian territories if that was what was in the best interest, the leadership of the PA, if that was what was in the best interest of the Palestinian people. And that was, was, was a discussion that after 1992 and after Oslo really divided the Palestinian people where there suddenly was this concept of a two-state solution that had never existed before, or a one-state solution, and families were disrupted by that. And the Palestinians li living in the 48 territories were disrupted by that because for a long time it, we were all in struggle together. But all of a sudden, everybody wasn't talking about them. Nobody was talking about the refugees. Our only concern became the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And there were those that said, that's the pragmatic way to do it. Let's get this first, and then we'll get all of Palestine. Um, or let's just get this and divide the country, and everybody will be happy. Um, but 20 years on, we found that that was an epic failure. You know, and, and that's the situation we are in today. That is the reason why we lack leadership right now, or a unified vision right now, is because of Oslo. I, I just want to, in regard to Oslo, I, I don't think it was a total failure, because the way I see it, and I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel, I think we gained, because before Oslo, we wouldn't be allowed to raise the Palestinian flag in Israel. Oslo changed the law in the Knesset to allow Palestinian citizen of Israel to have it legal to raise the flag. So now we have one flag with it, uh, one thing as a symbol. That, that's a result of Oslo. That's not true. What's that? The raising of the Israeli, the Palestinian flag in Israel is still formally uh, a criminal offense. Now, the, now it's become uh, extremist. 
they haven't been uh, using it much, but police, I mean, I have statistics about the number of detainees due to raising the Palestinian flag in the, five, in the past five years. And it's still, Fatah is, I mean, the PLO and Fatah are still terrorist organizations under Israeli law. I mean, the Palestinians inside the West Bank are allowed to raise the Palestinian flag in the West Bank. In the West Bank, yeah. That's but true. In Israel? But, but after, after the beginning of Oslo... They are... I mean, it's... The Knesset changed the law after Oslo? There's a difference between allowing, uh, by just practice, the law is still... I mean, the law states that you cannot raise the flag of any enemy state, and it never exempted the Palestinian um, groups or organizations that were uh, uh, defined as terrorists from that definition. So it's still, the police still arrests people in demonstrations merely for raising the Palestinian flag, even if it doesn't occur always. But the fact that they are raising it and they were not doing it before also, that's the change. I mean, a lot of things change. I'm sorry. No. Maybe it's the willingness, but it, it, it's true in terms of legalities, in terms of laws, it's, it hasn't changed. Um, some things were lifted. So, for example, in, in up until uh, 1992, up until Oslo, to go into Palestine uh, through the Alembi Bridge, they would strip search you, they'd take all your clothes out, you weren't allowed to bring any food or drinks or anything in a closed container, you couldn't bring any electronics in with you. Um, that all was, makeup was not allowed, Every, anything that was clothed, to, children's toys were not allowed. After Oslo, you had the PA come in, they stood in the front, the Israelis <coughs> stood behind the glass mirror. The Palestinians would take your identification card, put it in through the Israelis. It was still the Israelis that were behind the mirrors. Oslo kind of gave them this beautiful mirage and made people feel like we can raise the Palestinian flag, we can come into Palestine and, and, and cross the border and only interact with Palestinians. But even that mirage lasted very briefly, up until the Second Intifada, up until 2000. So from 1993, 94 till 2000, five or six years, and then even that crumbled. You know, so any small gains, yes, you can tell me that there's, you know, you can move around Ramallah a little bit more free. But in 2000, they did a re-incursion, set up the checkpoints, and then you had 500 checkpoints in the West Bank overnight, right? Then they started building the wall, and then they started taking more land. So ultimately, I mean, whatever benefit is so minimal in terms of the individual freedoms that people felt, that you can't compare them to the overarching problem that Oslo created. You know, I, I, I noticed, you know, because I, I've been there before and after, and I noticed that if you have funerals inside Israel for Palestinians, they raise the Palestinian flag. It could be. Whether right. it's a Shahid or, or a different religion. Right. But they raise it. I don't hear people getting arrested for that. It's a I mean, small game. It's a small game. But I'm just saying that it's not always implemented for different reasons. But I can pull up statistics about how many people have been arrested in the, in the recent, like from. 2012 to 2017 based on this issue alone. So it hasn't been legalized. The, <coughs> the nationalist and, uh, sentiments of Palestinians within Israel have increased since the uh, Second Intifada, uh, seeing that we, uh, we also lost 13 uh, uh, young people uh, in, in those events. Uh, due to snipers and other uh, illegal activities by the police. Um, and then that led to us re-envisioning ourselves as part of the Palestinian people as a whole and not as a minor national minority the way that the Oslo kind of accords envisioned us. Uh, so there are simultaneous kind of uh, um, you know trends that were happening and I wouldn't really credit the Oslo uh, um, whatever agreement for, you know, widening the right to raise the flag. That, I really contest that notion. It's more like I believe Shara's movement. Exactly. The, the other, the inside Palestine political movement, they've matured as it pertains to if identity anything. and political. So uh, I agree. It's, if anything, it's the 
rejection of Oslo by Palestinians in 48 that led to the increased nationalist sentiment and the uh, uh, you know the Tajammu Party and then Azmi Chara rising up yes. and until this day the, this kind of uh, uh, diverse political uh, scene that you see within Palestinians but it wasn't directly due to the, uh, the Oslo uh, agreement I wouldn't credit that um, okay. Yeah. Anybody else that has not had a chance to speak yet? In the back? Uh, so I'm so worried about getting used to president. Uh, and thinking through kind of how would we create a then I, I teach at CUNY, um, and I know CUNY has had its share of both the NYPD being everywhere. Um, I think the closest we got was the Association of University Professors putting out, after many times of attempting to do something for calls for some kind of resolution, uh, they put out a, a balanced kind of report about academic boycott, um, pros and cons kind of thing. Um, I think the only union in the U.S. is the Union of Electrical Workers, and I'm not, I don't remember exactly where, that has you know, kind of signed on to support this. But unfortunately, even when, you know, U.S. faculty members are being targeted, uh, unions have not even stepped up to support their faculty members. And it's, it's, it's very problematic. Um, but just to go back for a second to what you were saying earlier, uh, I worked at Birzeit University for six or seven years, and we used to have um, the right to education campaign. And I know for many years they used to bring students and faculty members from Birzeit to kind of tour and explain what it means to have right to education under occupation. And I think right now in the U.S. the right to education is also being called into question. And this could be something and the right of you know, um, undocumented students that, are, that might be, lose their right to education. The right of um, you know, equal education for African American and Latinx and other students. And I think that framework in universities makes a lot of sense. And I think that there is a connection um, that can be made. And again, 
instead of worrying about getting to the Zionists, let's get to our African American partners, let's get to our Latinx partners, let's get to our Southeast Asian partners, let's get to other people that are going through the same struggle because they are our um, uh, brothers and sisters in struggle and we will become the mainstream. We don't have to run after the mainstream. And then when these cousins, are gonna and then when these cousins <laughs> will see that they're part of a minority and ask her, Wendy, what should I do? <laughs> uh, I'll build that. Uh, so I think this is a good point you're uh, bringing up. Um, there is a tendency to exceptionalize Palestine in a way that allows a lot of progressives in the US to say, you know, the, the peps, like the progressive except for Palestine. Um, and I think de-exceptionalizing Palestine is important. Um, and actually, um, the Adala Justice Project, um, which I, the sister uh, organizations for Adala, Black and Haifa, and Haifa um, is actually trying to do that here. We speak a lot uh, on panels where, you know, different kinds of activists would, would, be, would present their you know, their narrative and their stories. Um, in that way, I'd like to say that we're trying to kind of expose the technologies of oppression through the, those stories. And it's very valuable in that you see that land taken for the Mexicans 100 years ago, is, or 150 years ago now, is the same kind of legal technologies that were adopted by Israeli courts 100 years later to kind of justify this settler colonialist uh, practice uh, of, of this, uh, depossessing people from their uh, uh, property. So I think this kind of link, links uh, uh, between different struggles is important in order to kind of answer the question about complexity. It's too complex, so many dates, so many facts, I'm not sure I know what's, what it's about. So it's, it helps a lot. Actually, we had talked about our next event being uh, something particularly oriented to students and repression going on at universities and colleges, not only around the Palestinian issue, but other issues. And I think that the campaign on deadly exchange, I'm not sure everybody would know about that, that JVP has launched, is related to that. And this deadly exchange is the exchange between the uh, police forces in the United States and the Israeli Defense Forces, where the police forces in the United States are getting trained by the Israeli Defense Forces in how to repress and oppress demonstrations <coughs> and other kinds of uh, civil, uh, uh, civil liberties actions here using the model of what they do against the Palestinians over there. And that there's a, there is a campaign which, you know, we, have, we haven't really uh, made a huge thing on it here as yet. We're still studying it and trying to understand how to do that. But a lot of the militarization we saw in, in Ferguson and in other cities and towns where there was um, demonstrations against police brutality by primarily Black Lives Matter and other African American organizations, they brought out a lot of the military, not only equipment that the US military had donated to them, but also tactics that they had gotten out of this exchange. And so that's, you know, that's something that we are uh, considering also and trying to learn more about. And also, why well, we need more people to sign up and join with us so we can share these, all these tasks. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to say that our next meeting is on December 17th. And if you sign our, our email list, um, you will be getting notice of where, you, of where that meeting is. It will be on Sunday. It's always at 1 30. Um, and we will be talking about where we're going and what our next events are going to be. So if you have ideas and would like to be part of that discussion, please come to that next meeting. Um, I have two other things to say. The American Revolution, boycott was a huge part of the American Revolution. I mean, that's what the Boston Tea Party was. American housewives <coughs> stopped buying sugar because there was a tax on sugar as part of the American Revolution. Totally different question now. I have a friend a lovely person who went to Israel on one of these um, propaganda tours. I don't know how birth, else to birth describe it. No, it wasn't birth by it was something else. She went with her son to the synagogue. She came back and she said, how can you how can you talk about the rights of the Palestinians in Israel? Everything for them is so wonderful. Look, they're part of the Knesset. 
exit, they can do this, they use that. Is there like a book, a document? I mean, I would love to have something to show people like my friend Susan that, hey, I mean, you know, you were brainwashed. <laughs> no, I mean, I visit our website. I mean, we have a lot of stories, but again, like it's the same. This argument drives me crazy, and I'm going to be a little bit uh, controversial here. It's like saying that slavery did go to African Americans because now they're not living in Africa. Yeah. I mean, it's it's this type of argument is 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 the essence of col colonialism in in one sentence. Basically, we're the barbarians. The the European Jews are the and actually, Israeli Jews in Israel suffer from the same stereotype. We should mention that. So basically, uh, um, the European Jews saved us from ourselves and provided us with all that, you know, wonderful uh, uh, democracy. But then again, why are we uh, are complaining? Uh, so really, a lot of there's a lot of information out there about concrete policies. You can start off with um, Adela.org uh, website. Um, I mean, I can provide you with a list of like academic books, but I'm sure your friends wouldn't be interested in the exclusionary constitutionalism of the Israeli uh, uh, legal system, uh, which is pretty elaborate, but um, it's, it's fairly, you know, um, uh, scholarly. So just learn. And I'm. Um, the Idala website also has a list of the somewhere around like 50, uh, around like 500 laws that 50. are 50 that are clearly discriminatory, that are Jews only. And, uh, the website is very user friendly, has a lot of wealth of information. Right, and, and please just contact lawyers at Adela, I mean, through the email uh, uh, address that is, is on our website with any question. I mean, we're always happy to provide, you know, more focused uh, um, answers if the website doesn't. John, can we make a short one? Uh, Biden has to yes. catch a train. Very short. Oh, it's six. Let's, uh, let's just do the question. Yeah, 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 yeah sorry. Quick question following up on your mention of, of Israeli Jews in Israel. Right. Uh, Ruben Avergal, who was the founder of, of the Israeli Black Panthers, um, spoke at JVP's national membership meeting this last year. Um, I'm just curious because obviously many Israeli Jews are part of the Likud coalition. On the other hand, you have people like Ruben. I was just curious right. whether in practice there's any significant um, alliance between um, Israeli Jews who see connections between oppression of Palestinians and their own oppression. Not on a, um, I would say, official level. There are some, um, I know wonderful Israeli Jews activists who are also uh, left-leaning, but History and <coughs> circumstance has led to, the, to, to a reality where most Mizrahi Jews were concentrated in certain areas in Israel. They were deprived of many um, uh, social and uh, political opportunities, and um, there wasn't a lot of contact between Palestinians and Mizrahi Jews. And on some occasions, even where contacts existed in Jerusalem, the state saw it as dangerous and tried to divide uh, the two communities. So there isn't a lot of solidarity. And sadly, a lot uh, of the Mizrahi population is right wing. Um, but they, they are being more mobilized now separately, um, speaking more Mizrahi politics, which really died after the Black Panthers of the 70s. Um, and now it's kind of gaining momentum again. And some activists, not a lot, not the majority by any uh, estimate, are trying to create these uh, links, and we'll see what happens with those. I would like to thank our speakers. For